everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein webinar series. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and tonight we're very fortunate to have Whitney Howerton with us, who's going to review strategies to reduce airborne contaminants during hygiene visits. It's a very opportune time for us to take advantage of all the considerations we can do for air management, uh, and Whitney will review that for us as well. Uh, please note that there is no CE for tonight's webinar. What I'd like to do is start off with just a little bit of background for everybody. And when we do that, it's important for us to take account who's presenting, but also the latest recommendations for pre, post, and mid procedural rinses. We want to identify ways that we can reduce this through hand instrumentation, aerosol generation. And then you have a, a treat at the end regarding some of the new innovations that are coming forth for the hygiene market. Now we're all familiar with probably going down the rabbit hole with a lot of different organizations and regulations that seem to change daily. Uh, it starts with the CDC, which has done a wonderful job. OSAP has really stood up with giving dentists and dentistry a way of looking at. The American Dental Hygiene Association has also brought in uh, vital regulations or recommendations of how we can treat patients better. And the one that you probably don't know on this screen is ASHRAE. Now, ASHRAE is the organization for heating and air uh, conditioning around the world. And so when you look at these and the engineers that had looked at air um, modification and airflow, it's really incredible that we have to take information from all of these sources to really guide us when we treat dentistry and when we deliver quality dentistry. Now, when we look at it, we're certainly in the COVID awareness uh, project, and we should be all certainly aware of all this. But in general, there are four transmission routes that we know about. A direct contact, that's hand-to-hand -hand battle, basically getting it, touching another person. Uh, indirect comment, uh, contact, those are called fomites. That's what, if somebody sat in a chair and then you sat in the chair in the arms and the virus was still there and you picked it up, that's kind of indirect contact. And then we have two that haven't been really associated in the past with or taken into consideration in the past very significantly. And that's droplet and airborne. And we'll go a little bit more into that, but it seems like with the COVID system, it's certainly primarily a droplet and airborne transfer. Initially, the WHO mentioned that it was hand-to-hand -hand or at least fomite, but we know now it's primarily an airborne area. Now we know that because in Guangzhou, China, in January 24th, 2020, this was the first indication. If you've heard this story before, this is a very uh, five-story restaurant. One person came in pre-symptomatic uh, with COVID-19 and sat there. And you can see this is just a magnification of the restaurant that they were in. And so what happened then is over the next few weeks, people that were sitting at that table, or more importantly, people that were sitting at other tables, and they went back and watched the, C's, the closed circuit television and saw there was really no contact with these people. What they did then analyze is the airflow or the ability of the flow of the air from start to finish, being some escapes that way. It was a very poor ventilated room. And what they saw was people in that room that were in the airflow from that pre-symptomatic patient nine diners uh, received uh, and got COVID and nobody else that wasn't in the airflow got it that night. So what they really went back and tracked that. And we know that also that in the United States during a choir practice, 87% uh, of the choir or the group developed COVID-19 from a pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic patient. So we know it can transfer this way. But the good thing is we also know we can stop it. And this is a famous study that 15, uh, Two stylists that were pre-symptomatic uh, spent at least 15 minutes with their clients cutting hair, styling hair, but all the patients, or excuse me, all the customers had masks, and the two uh, pre-symptomatic uh, stylists had masks on. So when we do it right, we can break that chain of infection, and that's what we're talking about tonight in dentistry. And we know on and on about, you know, yes, dentistry creates aerosols and we have to produce aerosols primarily to produce dentistry. You know, when you have a high speed hand piece or an ultrasonic scaler or even an air water syringe. But the truth of the matter is 
everything is an aerosol generating procedure. If you speak louder, you create more aerosol. If you speak actually in some languages that have a very hard uh, consonant sound to it, you can create more aerosols. And you can see that this hand-to-hand -hand combat has really changed. If you look at baseball recently, this is an argument in baseball now. So everybody is taking it very seriously and dentistry has to as well. But the greatest thing is our profession was ready for and able to accommodate this. As you can see, and just look at the last bullet, to date in the United States, clusters of healthcare personnel have tested positive and have been identified in hospital settings and long-term care, but no clusters have been reported in dental settings or among dental healthcare professionals. That's a wonderful statement and we wanna keep it that way, obviously, so we need to take all the precautions that we can. Uh, just to be clear, in China and in Italy, there have been dental professionals that have uh, uh, contracted COVID in a dental related system. So we're not out of the woods, but taking some of the things Whitney is gonna share with us certainly will make it prudent to do so. And we're pretty well aware of 2004, Mol Molinari et al kind of defined what aerosol and splatter were and the differentiation of that and how aerosol was created. And that's back in 2004, primarily when the first SARS went through uh, the world. And when we compare aerosol versus splatter, there's typically something regarding the size of the droplet. And usually there's something carrying a virus into the air and it can be a moisture drop uh, and splatter is a little larger. And it's important to note that aerosols stay up into the air longer and, and splatter has a tendency to drop, they say ballistically, almost like you would shoot a bullet. It will, after a period of time, tend to go to the floor. But aerosols can follow the airflow. And in many offices, we don't know what that airflow is. In many offices, the hygienist or the assistant or the dentist running around the office create their own airflow and take air with them. So it's real important that we take that in, consider in consideration. And we know the steps that are taken from ultrasonic scalers, air polishing, air water syringe, every time we take an impression out of the mouth and just blow it off so we can see if, there's, uh, if we captured the margins, we're actually creating aerosols. Anytime a patient sneezes in the chair, anytime we have is airborne, we have to be considerate of it and take, uh, or all the time prepare for that as well. And certainly when we prepare teeth or even oral surgery creates that for a greater extent. And it's just not isolated to the, the back or the operatory or different rooms, it's in the waiting room. You know, times are changing, we're taking an uh, upholstery out of the waiting room. We're making sure we can clear everything. We're putting air purifiers in uh, as Whitney will go through, but we're taking considerations for our patients. Why? Because OSHA and because not only are we as dental professionals uh, taking care of patients where we have to consider CDC, FDA and other regulations, but as employers, we also are taken care of by OSHA. And when we are creating air generating procedures, AGPs, Dentistry has been listed as in the very high category. And as a hygienist or a hygiene professional, you know you're in the top category of this as well. And so we really look to groups like the ADHA, who's provided incredible insight about this as well, following the leads of ADA and CDC and taking it into account to a realistic setting. And then there, if you are using aerosol generating procedures, they recommend source control, like using high evacuation, uh, as high volume evacuation, as long as well as forehanded dentistry. And we'll be able to address that just a bit as well. So it's real important that we know. And now we bring in another organization, the one that has really spent the longest time looking at pollutants, which we're talking about here with aerosols, whether it's a pollutant about uh, aerosol generating procedure, bacteria, viruses, we really want steps in controlling air pollutants. And they've already documented all this and it follows along exactly what Whitney will be talking about. The most effective way is let's not create an aerosol. Let's control it at the source and we have ways to do that. The second one is it does, if it does get out of the mouth, let's increase ventilation to get it away from the dental health care professional and as well as the patient. And then finally, can we clean that air throughout the offices? So this is something that's been a standard in the EPA of taking these three steps that can provide you the most effective use in our area 
of creating an environment that's not only safe for dental professionals, but also their patients. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Whitney and she'll take it from here. Whitney, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Severance. Let me get this screen shared with you guys. And I do want to say, just as she's sharing, you know, Whitney is a clinical education manager for Young Innovations. Uh, she has completed her master's in dental hygiene from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. She's worked full time as a clinical and didactic instructor and is a proud member of the ADHA and ADEA. ADEA. Whitney, thank you again. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really um, excited to deliver this guys uh, to you guys tonight. So um, when looking at strategies to really reduce airborne contaminants during a hygiene visit and really during any patient visit, our first steps are really making sure that we are informed, which is what Dr. Severance just provided to us, a great overview and background of aerosols and spatter and what's happening in our environment right now. But also we have to be prepared. You know, we have to be prepared for our patient arrival for our clinical day. So the first thing that I like to do um, as a fellow clinician is gather all the items that I need for patient care um, PPE, including getting all of my trays and procedures ready. So I want to avoid interrupting any type of treatment as much as possible because we've all at some point, you know, forgotten the air water syringe or forgotten the high volume suction or we realize we're missing gauze. And at this point, if we have to, you know, doff all of our PPE and then run and go get it, if there's not someone to help us, it can be um, a huge, you know, time sink where we're just, we're losing so much time. So also, I want you to kind of look at this tray set up and think, you know, disposable, right? The majority of the stuff on this tray is completely disposable. And in addition to disposable products and barriers, we're able to really reduce cross-contamination. We don't know when a lot of these aerosols are going to fall. We want to produce the least amount of spatter or splatter as possible. Uh, something else I like to draw your attention to on this tray, outside of the majority of it being disposable, is that I like to keep my instruments packaged and wrapped until patient arrival. You don't have to hold it, you know, near them or in their face by any means when you're opening it, but just so they can see it there. They see that it's sterile, that it's safe, that it's packaged. You know, we don't want to walk into um, a dentist office or a doctor's office and see things already exposed. We don't know how long it's been open or, um, or on there. So. A really quick quote that I want to read you from an article that was released in RDH magazine that really just gives me goosebumps every time I read it. Um, so I want to share it with you guys to kind of get your mindset rolling and what we're going to talk about next is dental hygienist, you know, as well as dentist and dental assistants value providing our patients with the best standard of care and we are held accountable for using professional clinical judgment. We each treat each patient, you know, we went through a program, we went through an educational process, and we're required to pass testing to prove that we know what is best for ourselves and for our patients. So as we discuss, you know, various products moving through the rest of this um, time together, we're going to look at reducing those aerosol contaminants specific to a hygiene visit. And then we always have to remember we're just using our best clinical judgment to what is available to us. And, and what's gonna protect us and our patients. So now that our trays are ready, we're ready for the day, we have our PPE and everything that we need, our patients have arrived. And one of the biggest recommendations that, that maybe your office you know, already had it in play or maybe you've re-implemented it or, or maybe you implemented it in school or you had it in school but then you stopped using it because it just added a few extra seconds to your procedure time is really offering your patient that pre-rinse before you get started, as soon as they're seated, let's get them a pre-rinse. And a few facts about pre-rinses. There is no scientific evidence that says the use of a pre-procedural rinse will completely reduce the risk of disease transmission. And also, um, it does aid in reducing aerosolization. It really reduces the amount of microorganisms available in the aerosols or splatter that we're producing. So only two of these featured here, and I will tell you guys, this is a very, very small sampling of all of the different types of mouth rinses available on the market. We could have several slides of mouth rinses if we wanted to try to cover them all. So 
only two of the ones shown here actually have um, conducted research and proven um, to be effective against the human coronavirus. So as of today, you know, August 3rd, only two so far. So of course, I think we'll see more. But on June 18th, the faculty at the University of Connecticut Health Division, they discovered that povidone iodine in its lowest concentration of 0.5% um, with an exposure period of 15 seconds was enough to completely inactivate SARS-CoV-2 in the lab. So after further testing, they have made the recommendation um, for patients as a use when it comes to an antiseptic solution, that as clinicians, we can use a 0.5% dilution. And that should be done immediately before um, rinsing. We wanna mix, we wanna pour that compound right before rinsing. And the rinsing should last for at least 30 seconds. So the only contraindication right now for the uh, povidone iodine products is anyone that, of course, that's allergic to iodine, um, even pregnancy or someone with thyroid problems may have um, a contraindication for the exposure to iodine. And then also earlier in July, so this year, still just, just last month, I can't believe it's already August, uh, Oracare released a study showing that their product, uh, their two-step Oracare rinse, kills 99.99% .99 of human coronavirus in as little as one minute and up to 60 minutes with no negative effects to the oral tissue, unlike some of the potential negative effects that, that we may see with prolonged use of hydrogen peroxide. So as clinicians, we have to think about, you know, completing our pre-procedural rinses to reduce that initial bacterial load that's in the mouth. But we do need to know that it does not 100% completely eliminate the risk of disease transmission. Also, we have to think about mid-procedural rinses or even post-procedural rinsing. Depending on the length of the procedure, if you're doing a longer dental procedure, um, if you're doing, you know, scaling and root planning as a hygienist, you may want to stop for a moment and do a mid-procedural rinse because we know specifically, you know, with the virus that we're dealing with now, as our patients are breathing, they could be drawing, you know, microorganisms into the nose and into the mouth. So recontaminating those areas. So there's nothing that tells us we cannot do a mid-procedural rinse or even a post-procedural rinse before the patient is released um, into the office. You know, we know we're going to have them, you know, put on their mask again, but we don't want them to get lost or get turned around or run to the restroom or take their mask down. So even a, a very, you know, very end or post-procedural rinse is recommended as well. I also attended um, an info session on like ozone therapy. So there's information out there um, in regards to the use of ozone. So I would definitely suggest looking into that if that's something um, that you're currently using. And then now that we've pre-rinsed our patient, we're ready to actually treat them, right, for their hygiene visit. So we have to think about what should we be doing? What are the current recommendations at reducing aerosols when it comes to patient care? And we know that there have been a lot of feelings, you know, from the clinical world around hand instrumentation versus ultrasonic instrumentation. You know, what's right for our patients, what's right for our hands and ergonomics, and what's right for our sanity and the end of the day, you know. So I don't want to debate with you guys by any means because I, we're going to use our professional judgment, right? Just like that quote said from the article in RDH, we're going to use our professional judgment. We are educated to do so. So I know that there are a lot of feelings around both technologies, but I do want to talk about hand instrumentation with you guys because we are being encouraged by the CDC to reduce any aerosol generating procedures as much as possible which for dental hygienists would mean not using our ultrasonic scalers as much, going back to hand instrumentation throughout the entire appointment. So I just wanna share some of these with you. So hand instrumentation particularly, obviously is gonna reduce aerosol production, but something about hand instruments that you have to be very, very mindful of is that you want your instruments to be sharp. That helps reduce hand fatigue. It also helps prevent burnishing of those deposits. And that's where using a sharpen free product, um, like the ones I'm showing you here, uh, these are XP sharpen free instruments by American Eagle. So when you don't have to sharpen them, you don't have to worry that you've potentially recontoured the cutting edge. You haven't even touched it. You haven't had to touch it. 
So you can save on hand fatigue. You can, you know, be confident that you are not burnishing because it employs a different technique of, of shaving or planing the calculus away. So when you think about different products and innovations that are out there, there are ways for you to, to mitigate those risks of aerosols, to utilize hand instruments that can also protect you ergonomically. Um, also, you don't have to waste time potentially coming in early or staying late to sharpen or just hoping that a patient has canceled. But also, if you're using a stainless steel based product that does have to be sharpened, I want you to do a true assessment of how often you sharpen versus how often you should be sharpening or even how often you should be replacing your instruments because we're very, very guilty of keeping them way too long. So when it comes to um, instruments, there are a few key considerations to look at when you're, you're thinking about replacing them. Maybe you have it on your to-do list to get some new ones because you're using them more. You wanna look at the weight of the handle you know, a resin handle, of course, is going to be much lighter. There was research done in 2017, and I'm expecting some more um, coming in 2020 by Jessica Sudebeck and several of her peers that showed the heavier the, the weight of the handle, you're going to get more negative musculoskeletal effects in that hand and wrist. So you have to protect yourself if you want this to be, you know, a, a career, you want to have career longevity as a clinician. Also, you want to be mindful of the diameter of the handle, something that's nice and wide, like the ones you see here. The really small, solid metal handles are not ideal for us ergonomically. And then also you wanna be mindful of the texture. That's also just a layman's word for knurling or the pattern on the actual handle of the instrument that gives you greater tactile sensitivity and also helps with your grasp not to slip as you're, as you're scaling or biting. So again, you know, with the difference between a stainless steel or sharpen free instrument, you know, the technique can be different. So more ergonomically safer for the clinician, more comfortable for the patient, and then not having to sharpen. I've been using these um, for 12 years. I actually had a chance to use sharpen free as a student. So send me any of your questions. I'm happy to answer those for you. In addition to, you know, kind of employing our hand instrumentation more than our ultrasonic instrumentation is going to be the use of high volume evacuation when we're doing any type of aerosol generating procedures. And Dr. Severance also mentioned, you know, when we looked at those four key things or those five key things of how we're producing aerosols being ultrasonics, our high speed hand pieces, the use of our air water syringe or, you know, prepping a tooth if you're a dentist that's that's watching tonight. So we have to use our high volume evacuation. We need to practice forehanded dentistry as much as possible, which a lot of hygienists may not be used to. But when using high volume evacuation, research does show that it can reduce aerosols in the dental environment by over 90%. I've seen some stating 95 or even 98 for some of those internal studies. So let's look at a few of these high volume evacuation products. And I like to say that these have like a bonus. They're, they're HVE products with a bonus because they have both uh, magnification through you know, a mirror or illumination through a mirror, as well as a retraction, isolation, or even you know, bite block option. So a few of the high volume evacuation products available on the market, again, just a few, we could have slides and slides of these because there's so many great uh, manufacturers of these products. But one of them um, is a new bird mirror, this one has a high volume evacuation with a mirror, multiple holes around the edge of the mirror, as well as the PureVac. Um, this one is by Dent Supply, autoclavable up to 100 times. The one by Newbird is also autoclavable. There are other disposable um, high volume evacuation mirrors on the market as well. So both disposable and autoclavable categories. Remember, I'm kind of a fan of disposable, so that's just, that's just my preference. I like to reduce cross-contamination as much as possible. And then also some of the high volume evacuation with a bonus that have um, isolation, retraction, and evacuation. These are just a few again. Um, there's Mr. Thirsty by Zerk pedo and adult size. There's also the ISOVAC or ISOLITE system. 
that has a disposable bite block with an autoclavable body by Zyrus, and then also the dry shield system that has an autoclavable bite block and body. So, so a lot of systems are similar. It just kind of depends on what you need as an office and what works for you and your patients. So again, just a few on the market when it comes to high volume evacuation products used intraorally. So in addition to the ones that are available intraorally, there are also you know, external or even portable evacuation options as well. So a few products available here, there's the um, A-Flex Assist Arm. So this was initially designed to hold like a standard evacuation tip. And then since the pandemic, they have added a silicone autoclavable funnel to kind of gather in more aerosols away from the, the patient area. There's also the um, extra oral suction system by ADS. You can see really great in this picture how nice it fits comfortably um, near the patient, but it's not too obstructive. And it just has that gentle arm that comes out and over a nice open conical shape too to gather in those aerosols away from the treatment area. And then a fairly um, new product to market that's um, almost in a prototype phase, it's not quite ready for sale, but I think you can like pre-order it, is the Safe T Shield by Ergonomic Products. This is actually um, an evacuation unit that ties into your evacuation lines, and it's on a track on the ceiling, so you pull it forward as needed. So there are a lot of ex um, extra oral and external and portable evacuation devices as well. Now, some of these devices, as well as a few that I'm going to show you in just a minute, do have HEPA filters or ULPA filters, U-L-P-A filters, or even UV treatment to really help reduce those airborne contaminants. And these are some survey results from a recent article released by the Williford Group that show that 238 out of 300 dental practices purchased air purification equipment for their offices. A lot of these items ranged in price, you know, some exceeding, you know, several thousand dollars. So you do have to decide what's feasible and economical for your practice. And this topic has been, I mean, are these products, you know, they've been a really hot topic for the last few months. And they're products that people aren't as familiar with prior to our current um, pandemic, but I think we'll continue to utilize because we see their benefit. So a few of these that are available um, do have UV properties and HEPA properties or ULPA properties combined. There are, um, of course, independent units that offer either. So when it comes to like UV-based products, I want you to look at a couple things. Number one, you want to look at the UV wavelengths, specifically the UVC. That is the, the ultraviolet um, kind of radiation classification that puts it into a germicidal irradiation range. You want to look at UVC. Um, ideally, depending on the size of your treatment room, you would want it to be about 100 to 280 um, nanometers with a maximum um, peak at 265. But there's lots of different devices out there. What's cool about it, and I want to show you several of them, and I'm going to show you a couple more products because I found so, these are so interesting to me. And it's something that, you know, the clinical practice where I work, we did not have this on the clinical practice prior to the pandemic. So there's so much research to be done um, when you decide to add this to your treatment room. So um, another product, or the one product that you see to the left, this is the Vita Shield. Um, it easily mounts like in the ceiling. It just replaces kind of one of your standard ceiling tiles. And it's super quiet. It, you know, on their website, it even says ultra quiet air circulation. And it also has a light panel. So you don't have to you or you lose your overhead lighting. It has a light panel like LED lights or um, even the bulb style lights available. Then also there are air purifiers, like the one you see here in the middle um, by Jade Air. With these, this system in particular offers both HEPA filtration, it also has carbon filters, and it has those germicidal UVC bulbs for effective purification. And when you're looking at HEPA filtration or ULPA filtration devices, you really wanna look at the CFMs 
that's basically the amount of air turnover that a unit can have. And ideally, depending on the size of a treatment room, you want it to be between 300 and 350 CFMs to turn over that air and purify that air fast enough for you to really gain maximum benefit. So the larger the fan, the more CFMs it's gonna pull versus the smaller the fan, it's gonna take longer to turn over the air. So what I really like about this one um, with Jade Air is that it has four different speeds and the speed number three pulls at 390 CFMs. And if you need it, if you have a larger space, the turbo speed pulls at 406 CFMs. So it's an awesome product when it comes to not only filtration, but also having that UVC range to really sterilize the air. And then also to the far right, um, that's the fax station that's shown here also utilizing HEPA filtration and UVC as well. Um, this one has the capacity to circulate air in an eight by eight standard room 12 times per hour. So that basically means the air is circulating every five minutes. So you really wanna look at these tiny details of, of the wavelengths of UV, because when it comes to UV, the more wavelengths is not always better. You don't want it to be damaging to the eye or damaging to the skin. Some of the units require you to turn them on and leave the space. Other ones you can leave on while you're there during patient treatment. So you really wanna look at all of these tiny, tiny details. So I wanna show you um, a couple more options. I've gotten so many questions about this in the past. So we tried to include several options for you guys. So this is a line, um, this is the Radic 8 line that are sold exclusively uh, by Henry Schein. And these products have been proven and tested against bacteria strains, viruses, um, other VOCs and air pollutants that a single pass can kill 99.9999% with no recirculating pollutants. So when you look at a variety of devices, really look at like the size of the room that you're trying to, to sterilize. So you're looking at the device to the left is designed more of a tower style, is designed for like larger communal areas, a kind of open indoor floor plans. The model in the middle would be more for a medium or small like waiting room or waiting area or even a treatment room, depending on the size of the room. And then also the system to the far right, this is for um, smaller spaces, small offices, maybe a kitchen or a boardroom or something that you have in the dental practice or even transportation vehicles. So a lot of different systems are available, you know, that include not only HEPA filtration, but also those UVC lamps to really maximize air sterilization and reduce those airborne um, contaminants that, that we're creating during hygiene visits and dental visits. Another um, product or another step that has kind of gained traction in the dental field is cold fogging. So cold fogging systems use um, hypochlorous acid, which is a combination of water, non-iodized salt and vinegar solution to aid in reducing aerosols. Typically 200 parts per million is what's recommended. I've seen some pre-mixed solutions available at 200 or 300 parts per million. So you just have to decide you know, what's available and what you want to potentially utilize. But basically after a procedure, you're going to complete your disinfection steps. You're still going to use your disinfectant wipes or sprays to disinfect your treatment room and you're using cold fog, um, fogging as an adjunctive um, option there. And you're basically just gonna like sweep the ceiling. Think about if you were spray painting or painting you know, over the ceiling in nice stripes or layers, and they kind of, kind of mist over the clinical area and the patient chair as well. You don't wanna saturate these surfaces. So if you do a nice cold fogging mist, it's gonna dry within just one to two minutes. And after you're you know, disinfected, you're ready to treat your patient. So that's a great um, addition. If you're thinking about aerosols or you're unsure about adding a HEPA filter or some type of UVC product, cold fogging has, has really kind of become a, a new thing, I think, in our environment. Very few offices were using that before. And then finally, once we know how to purify the air, we're breathing in safe air, even through our mask, our patients are breathing in a safer air. We also have to think about, we've used our hand instruments, we've, we've reduced the amount of aerosols we're creating, but we wanna wrap up our patient appointment. And we still know that even, even now, years later, most of our patients think that the actual polishing is how we're cleaning their teeth. So 
a lot of patients are still expecting that. Clinicians are kind of in turmoil about whether they're supposed to polish or not. Um, maybe even deciding to do selective polishing instead of polishing the full mouth. So ultimately, you want to be using polishing products that are gonna help you reduce aerosols and splatter as much as possible when you decide to polish. So I know that you're gonna use your best clinical judgment because I chose to polish as a clinician. That's my patients, um, they expect it. So I, I did practice selective polishing. So some of you might've noticed that I had my handpiece on my tray when I showed you that image. So that was my professional decision based on my patient's needs. So when it comes to polishing, we have to think about our handpiece, we have to think about our profi paste, and we have to think about our profi angle that are all involved in one of these final procedures of patient care. So several states um, have mandated that handpieces need to be sterilized between each patient. And I actually, it should be 12 now. I just thought about that because I talked to a clinician in Nevada that sent me an email that said Nevada has also mandated this. So it's 12, 12 now, because we have to also remember that we have federal regulations and federal recommendations. But if your state or local government dictates something that's more strict of you, you have to follow the more strict guideline. So the CDC recommendation is to heat sterilize a handpiece between patient care, and that's the motor and the nose cone, not just wiping it down, because a lot of these corded, air-driven handpieces can draw microorganisms into the nose cone and into the motor. So 12 states have now said this is a requirement, not just a recommendation. So let's review how to properly disinfect, you know, a corded versus a cordless really quick. So I haven't seen any studies yet. I bet they're coming, you guys, but I haven't seen any studies just yet in regards to a corded versus cordless handpiece, you know, producing more or less aerosol or splatter. You know, I know a lot of companies, I'm sure, are doing their internal testing to, to give us as clinicians some hard data here. So until we see this research, until we see these hard numbers to show us, we still have to you know, do the best that we can, we have to follow these recommendations. So when it comes to corded hand pieces like the one on the right, uh, this one is the Young Hygiene hand piece. And I will say this, I do own this hand piece, you guys. And before I switch to a cordless hand piece, this was one of my favorites because it has like a little 45 degree contra angle that really helps like ergonomically bear the weight of the hose on the clinician's wrist. You know, you feel like you have to like throw the hose over your shoulder, like it, it bears the weight having that bend in the hose attachment. So for an example, with this being a corded hand piece, you're gonna wanna wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe. You can pop off the nose cone to make sure there's not any visible debris inside. It's very rare that you would see visible debris inside the nose cone, but, but if you see something or you feel a little uncomfortable, you could take your air or water. We don't want to push both buttons at the same time really anymore, right, and create too many aerosols. So air or water, blow out the inside of the nose cone, put it back on the handpiece. You know, you're going to put your oil, just standard maintenance, run the oil through, take it off, remove any excess oil, pouch it, or, or put it in your machine that's going to autoclave your handpiece. So you don't want to just wipe it down between patients because microorganisms can be drawn into those motors or nose cones. Now, when it comes to a cordless handpiece, you kind of have to change your thought process a little bit. You cannot put the motor in a um, in an autoclave, even though it is a semi-critical item, or it's defined as a semi-critical item that ideally should be heat sterilized. You can't put the motor in the autoclave. So, you're going to wipe down or disinfect um, the motor portion. So, in this case, it's the white handle portion. The silver portion or the nose cone is what is going to be heat sterilized between each patient. And then, of course, as you're assembling it, you're going to assemble those um, the nose cone with the handpiece and put a barrier sleeve over both components before you put on your profi angle of choice. 
So that's the difference there. We want to completely autoclave the motor and the nose cone when it comes to corded, and the nose cone or sleeve of a cordless device would get autoclaved, and the motor portion would get wiped down, and then preferably also barriered. You just want to give that added layer of protection between your contaminated hand and what's happening on that device. Just like using barriers on light switches and, and things like that, there's lots of little nooks and crannies that saliva or, or other bodily fluid could get in from our hand. So, so barriers, I'm a huge fan. Also, when it comes to polishing, like I said, you have to think about your handpiece, your profi angle, and your paste. So, you know, during these uncertain times, clinicians have to think about the tiny things, even down to the tiniest rubber cup on your profi angle if you're choosing to polish. A lot of clinicians like a profi angle that has ridges on the outside of the cup because it helps keep the paste, you know, on the cup and on the tooth. So Young has designed a new profi angle that is new to market as of late last week called Splatter Guard that actually reduces splatter by 15 times compared to a traditional profi angle. And they um, used focus groups and sent several different samples. And I will actually tell you, you guys, this product has been in the works for almost three years. So this is not a, oh, we have to make a brand new product because we're in the middle of a pandemic. This is not, you know, quality has not been compromised. This has not been rushed in production by any means. This has been in the process for several, several years. It just happened to launch at the right time. But um, several, uh, over a thousand hygienists have had a chance to try this product in the clinical trial phase. And nine out of 10 um, said that it significantly reduced splatter. So let me show you guys how the splatter guard works. Let me go back. Let me get this video going. Here we go, you guys. So I'm actually going to go back a slide because I want you guys to be able to, now that you've kind of seen the video, you've seen it in action, I hope that you saw, you know, the splatter guard versus the a traditional profi angle and you saw the reduction in splatter. So I will tell you full disclosure as a clinician to clinicians, when I first saw this, I thought, mm, I'm not sure about this. You know, it does have this small little wiper that's kind of under the profi cup, but how does it work? So I hope that you had a chance to see that in the video, but also um, if you look at different social media channels, there's, there's videos that clinicians have made, there's videos that I have made that show you how it's working with Profi Paste in a patient's mouth, so intraorally, um, it works, you guys. It might look a little odd, but it legitimately works. That blade tapers the paste um, and saliva toward the edge of the cup, so not only keeping the paste on the tooth, but also keeping the saliva also on the tooth and in the mouth. So I really hope that you guys um, try it. It is available through Henry Shine, so it's ready for you guys. It, it literally came out last week. So in conjunction to our profi angle choice, we have to think about an even smaller item that we use when polishing, and that's our profi paste. 
So making sure that you choose a profi paste that it's not overly watery um, or too thin or too creamy because that can increase splatter. I'll tell you that um, I, I purposefully use splatter guard on a patient that is like a hyper salivator and I use it in conjunction with the Vera Advance Bride on the right hand side which has a um, baking soda base and zero splatter. So I really want you guys to try it for yourself to get a to get a feel for it and to really see that it does reduce splatter by 15 times. So, you know, in conclusion with with what Dr. Severance has provided in our discussion on, you know, reducing aerosol contaminants and pre-rinsing or even mid-rinsing or post-rinsing using high volume evacuation, looking at HEPA filtration or UV-based products, thinking about proper sterilization of our hand pieces, profi paste and angles, and then really thinking about hand instrumentation over ultrasonics. The biggest thing that we have to do to ultimately protect ourselves and our patients is follow standard precautions. And when you look at the definition of standard precautions defined by the CDC, standard precautions are the minimum infection prevention practices that apply to all patient care, regardless of suspected or confirmed infection status of that patient in any setting where healthcare is delivered. So again, I'm confident in our clinical judgment, our abilities to decide what procedures, what products we're gonna to use to not only protect ourselves, but protect our patients and reduce you know, aerosol production. So another thing I would love to invite you guys to attend a free 1.5 hour CE course that is sponsored by Young Innovations um, entitled The Safe Dental Hygiene Appointment. It really walks through an entire patient visit focusing on both tips and products to break the chain of infection. Also from pre-screening the patient to treatment room disinfection, all the way to dismissal of the patient. So I think it's time you know, for question and answers. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So Dr. Severance and I will both be on here again for you guys and, and we'll take questions. Great, thank you, Whitney. Uh, great job. A lot of questions, a lot of interest in it, <clears throat> and some very astute uh, comments here. Um, we'll just run through this, if that's all right with you, and we'll share sure. based on information. Okay. So from Frank, um, he had preempted a little bit of the content. Has there been any confirmed COVID-19 cases arriving in any dental offices? Uh, I had shared a slide that as of now, we're not aware of that, but shortly thereafter, uh, an anonymous person said, I read there was an outbreak in a Fort Collins, Colorado dental office. Do you know any of the details? And during your program, I quickly went online to see because okay. we're all uh, being very aware and I was not able to find anything. So if there's any further comments or questions so far, uh, I'm not aware of any um, transmission dental related of COVID-19. <clears throat> a question then from Frank again. Will an N95 mask block the airborne aerosols that can remain in the air for 15 minutes or greater? So ideally, we wanna say yes, right? Because they're designed to filter smaller particulates that um, are microorganisms that can be in the air. Um, we have to also do our due diligence to reduce those aerosols that are being produced. We know that in particular, this virus can live on surfaces longer than some other microorganisms and could really you know, live in the air for several hours. So we have to use other products um, like cold fogging or those HEPA filtration products or UV products to really help us. So N95 is great, but we have to do other things to help ourselves. Yeah, good point. And the N95 is only as good as the fit, right? So if we right. keep the air out, uh, you can, but that's the intent of it. And we do know it can stay longer than the 15 minutes. Right. Um, <clears throat> what do you recommend doing for dental exams as a hygienist? While a dentist is working with their own patient, as far as switching from room to room and infection control? Ooh, that's a good one. So um, if there's a dental assistant available, you know, where you could really kind of practice forehand dentistry or hygiene and, and have someone to help set up and break down treatment rooms. I think when, you know, we're using additional products and like you mentioned, Dr. Severance, you know, if the masks are fit tested appropriately and the clinicians doing their personal seal checks to make sure that they're still effective, then, then I'm okay with, you know, a hygienist, you know, 
changing rooms, but also being mindful to change PPE. Like if they're leaving a patient in a room to go and, and help take radiographs or do something for an emergency patient, then they do have to be mindful of their PPE. Um, ideally, I would like them to put on, you know, maybe a, a level three mask or something over that N95 to, treat, to seat, um, sit down and work with that next patient or change their face shield, something so they're not carrying those microorganisms in to potentially expose another patient. So I would definitely change some of the PPE and hopefully there's an assistant or someone there that can help turn over the room so we know that the air itself is safe. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there are quite a few questions on the rinses that you showed. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned at the beginning that there were two. I know the chlorine dioxide, mm -hmm. um, which you had mentioned is one. They wanted to know what the second one was or didn't catch that. Uh, the povidone iodine, um, that was studied particularly by the uh, faculty at the University of Connecticut and their health division. They did study uh, povidone iodine and showed that at a 0.5% dilution, after just one minute of rinsing, it's effective. They showed 15 seconds in the lab, but their recommendation for patient use was to one minute. And then also it's effective for up to 60 minutes um, when you're looking at the chlorine dioxide products and things like that. So only two so far, chlorine dioxide and povidone iodine have been proven against human coronavirus. Okay, and then a couple other questions. Uh, I think they read a Rella Christensen article okay. uh, where she's recommending a 1.5% hydrogen peroxide to 30 mm -hmm. second. Um, and everything we can do to reduce bacterial, uh, as you mentioned, we're not sure about the COVID-19 necessarily, but do you have any recommendations on the 1.5 twice? So uh, with hydrogen peroxide, we are getting a lot of great benefits from that as well, you know, for bacteria reduction and other microorganism reduction. Um, I think the biggest concern is, you know, that recommendation did come out before the research about povidone iodine and prior to oral, uh, Oracare getting their study published. Um, the thing with hydrogen peroxide, it can have negative side effects um, intraorally. We can see it's not only lysing or killing the healthy uh, bad bacteria, but also the healthy ones too. So some patients experience um, burning mouth syndrome or even sloughing of tissue. So with prolonged use, you have to be mindful of hydrogen peroxide. And then also it's, it's readily available over the counter. So we wouldn't want to potentially mislead a patient that could go buy hydrogen peroxide and, and use it every day at home several times and then see some of those negative intraoral, potential negative intraoral effects. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you answered the question then also on the study of the uh, uh, iodine, potent yeah. and iodine was done mm -hmm. by which group? Uh, the uni the faculty at UConn, so the University okay. of Connecticut, their health division. And I may, um, I wanted to get my times correct because I, I have all this, this data yeah, yeah. on in my head. So for the povidone iodine-based rinses, they said a 15-second rinse with a 0.5% dilution worked in the lab. For patient okay. care, they recommended a 30-second rinse with a 0.5% dilution. The chlorine dioxide recommends one minute. I just want to make sure that was clarified yeah. between, because there's, you know, there's a few seconds difference there depending <laughs> on the product, so. Great. And now on instrumentation, American Eagle M23 TXP. Yeah, okay. Do you recommend? Is it good? I love it. So, okay. particularly the TXP is the thin version of the M23. So, that is a posterior sickle. Uh, think of it similar in design to a Barnhart 5.6, but it has a toe on it. So it's not ideal for deep pockets, right? Because it is a sickle. But the T implies thin, so it is 20% thinner than stainless steel. So you're not going to sharpen the XP Sharpen Free. Um, the thin line is particularly great for perio patients or even patients that have, you know, really tight, healthy gingiva, but you need to get a little subgingival. You're having a hard time accessing that really taut tissue. So, so absolutely. I love okay. that. It's one of my and then a follow, a follow up from Swati was uh, pro thin can actually <laughs> break easily. So the thin line or the pro thin line, like you're saying, um, if you're using it on a really heavy, tenacious deposit that is subgingival, I would rather you use a standard sharpen free instrument. Um, the thins are really designed, think of it for, you know, fine scaling and root planing, like finishing touches, because they're designed for those deep perio pockets for finishing touches, not for initial removal of those large heavy deposits. I'd rather you use a, a standard M23 sharpened XP for that and not the thin version. Okay. 
-hmm. How long do the sharpened free instruments last before they have to be disposed of? So that's a great question. Um, in general, you guys, not only sharp and free, but also stainless steel instruments should really be replaced every 12 to 18 months, maybe 24 months, depending on the number of kits you have or the number of cassettes and setups that you have, depending on the type and the variety of patients you're treating. And of course, we know calculus tenacity varies. So ideally every 12 to 18 months, up to 24, again, depending on if you have ample amount of cassettes or kits and, or you're in a general practice or a pedo practice, they're gonna last you longer than that. But that's the case with any instrument on the market, not just sharp and free. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. a pure, back on uh, high volume evacuation okay. options, uh, PureVac has been back ordered. Okay. Uh, is there a comparable product with the same level of evacuation accommodating uh, the size of the aerosol? So this is what's interesting about the high volume evacuation is there we have seen some studies that have been done in the past um, stating that the evacuation opening should be roughly eight millimeters or larger to also gather in aerosols, not just saliva or water or other bodily fluids that are going to be in that intraoral environment. So I've not seen anything outside of a standard evacuation tip that um, that has that singular opening. Um, a lot of them, like the mirrors that I showed um, and the other devices, have multiple small openings. So they're really designed for evacuation of saliva and, and water and other fluids. So my recommendation there would be a standard evacuation tip. And there's actually a small product called the Clip Mirror designed by Tr Patricia Blunden. She's a dental hygienist. And initially she designed a little small clip-on mirror for a low volume evacuation. And she now has one for high volume evacuation. So you still get the size of the opening and you could actually clip on an autoclavable mirror. So that would be my recommendation there. Okay. Um, from Maria, I have had pushback on sterilizing the motor for a profi at a clinic. Where can I find further info to sterilize the motor so that I can share with others? So I would definitely start with providing the office or whomever is kind of pushing back with you with the CDC recommendations because even though it's a recommendation, it doesn't mean it needs to be disregarded because your individual state may make it a rule um, or a regulation. Recommendation is a little bit different, but um, the other, you know, 38 states do need to be mindful of that. So I would definitely start with the CDC recommendation if you're not one of the 12 states. And then also, um, I'm happy to, you, you know, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I can give you, I can type it in the chat. My email address that's easiest to reach me at is education at younginnovations.com and I can send you the article that was cited on that slide so you would have that as some as some additional backup information. Great. Uh, maybe I can take this one too also from Maria. Okay. I thought that UVC light is not advised or recommended. I have seen a recommendation for a UV germicidal light instead. Uh, they're essentially the same, it's just a misnomer. UVC is a low wavelength of ultraviolet light, and the way they inactivate viruses and bacteria are called germicidal. So it's GVI, um, UV germicidal irradiation. Um, uh, there are two different types, really, one that goes into the air purifiers or try to capture and deactivate the RNA and DNA of the bacteria within a system, like an air purifier. Um, and then there's also these handheld ones that people are using, uh, although not necessarily recommended or proven, that do the same thing. All UV light is dangerous to uh, uh, living tissue. So that means the eyes and the, the skin as well. And that's why in these air filters, they're very much uh, shielded and protected and away from the patients so you're not able to see it. But I think Whitney is talking mostly about these air purification units, evacuation where you don't see the UVC. Right. It does require dwell time, which means distance, the intensity of the UV, and the airflow. So it's, a, it's a, uh, an added benefit to these purifiers that use help. Uh, but UV, GI, germicidal irradiation is the process that they use. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, and I got a little more feedback on, on doing some follow-up on the, has any uh, office uh, gotten that? So we'll continue to monitor that. Thank you very much for that. 
Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on reusing the N95 masks for more than one day? Ooh. <laughs> so that's kind of a gray area. Um, I recently, I would say maybe two months ago now, y'all this time it's flying by, but um, the CDC hosted a COCA call, like their clinical outreach team. And in that call, they stated to not reuse it more than five times. Now that's a very gray area because that could mean five days if you're practicing extended use where you're donning it, you're doing your seal check and you're wearing it all day, taking it off, putting it in a breathable bag, allowing it to sit sealed with your name and date on it for five days and then reusing it or extended using it again. Um, personally, I'm not comfortable with using it five times for that, that much of a period of time. But then if you're practicing reuse, you're donning it, doing a seal check, patient care, taking it off, you know, doing everything you need to do, donning it again. I just feel like with multiple donning and doffings, you're gonna eventually lose that seal. So the, the black and white answer was five times, but was that five times in one day or five times if you're practicing extended use, which means you're not taking it off until the end of the day. Very good point and a great clarification. It does become a professional judgment at that time. I think we've all seen the paper bags with five check marks, right? Yeah. Each time you've done it. <laughs> right. It's hard to imagine how that's done. Right. Um, and then Kathy Eklund, who has done a wonderful job of uh, providing chat and information here that I want to follow up with her on. What about following the interim CDC guidance for dental settings, droplet and airborne precautions, mm -hmm. in addition to standard precautions? So I definitely, absolutely, we're going to continue to use standard precautions every day, even once these interim guidelines either become our permanent guideline or they drop away. So I think, again, like Dr. Severance just said, we have to use our professional judgment. So we're going to continue to follow standard precautions no matter what. And that's a lot of categories, right? That's hand hygiene, that's PPE, that's disinfection. But then if those interim guidelines, even if they go away, if they make you feel safer, then I say still use them. Because right now we don't know if they're going to become permanent guidelines. But if they make you feel better, I would definitely continue to use them for sure, Kathy. Great. Uh, let's see. All right, this one might be me, but the, I'm a Henry Schein employee, so I'll take my best shot. Okay. How is Henry Schein as our dental supplier helping us uh, obtain N95 masks, face shields, and disposable gowns because they are telling us we can't get them. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a very critical time all around the world of trying to get PPE. Henry Schein is one of the largest um, um, distributors of medical healthcare equipment, scour the world. Uh, we know this uh, pandemic hit at the most inopportune time with the Chinese holiday hit China and slowed everything down. And so just to relay a little bit, Henry Schein does a wonderful job, as do all manufacturers, trying to get the right product. There are some many counterfeits. In one case, 400 different uh, sources that Henry Schein had to investigate. Only five were legitimate. So you can see that it's most important that you work with your manufacturer, whether it's Henry Schein or others, to make sure what you're getting is the, the value. That's another reason why the CDC and others don't ask um, the public to use N95s. They want them to use face shields or surgical masks or others, but even sometimes those are down. But we also wanna save those for healthcare professionals at the front line, which include dental hygienists, um, dentists, and dental offices, as well as, um, as well as all healthcare facilities. So, you know, consuming it and, and making sure it's used in the right position. <clears throat> of those, we continue to look at the ADA and their guidance as well. And most offices now have up to two weeks of N95s, face shields, disposable gowns, which we hadn't used in the great uh, past so often, are l lagging a bit. So we continue to look at that as well. We did, I know we're just two minutes over, but we did look at and talk about the 1.5 hydrogen peroxide as a pre-procedural rinse, uh, two 30 seconds areas. Two questions now. Um, have you ever heard of the Cavitron suction system safety suction by quality aspirators? I have heard of it. Um, I've not had an opportunity to use it, but for those of you that can't, you know, if you want to quickly look it up, um, it basically is an evacuation tube that follows a, the top of your ultrasonic insert 
to evacuate those aerosols that are being produced right at the source. So I've not had a chance to use it, but I have looked at it and I've definitely studied up on their website. So um, I would definitely encourage you, you, you have to try things. You have to look at their research. You have to look at other people's, you know, independent research if it's available and really decide what's ultimately safest and best and practical for you guys to use. Great. Uh, final one. Uh, what are your thoughts about Ergo Finger? Do you know that? Okay, so that's a uh, similar with that one. It's actually a uh, device that slides on your finger of choice. So probably your index finger. And it's actually going to help you support a standard evacuation tip. So it slides on your finger, the evacuation tip um, holds on the top. So you're able to retract the cheek and hold the evacuation tip at the same time. So it's like HVE with a bonus. So you get to do your <laughs> retraction, but the ergo finger fits on your finger of choice and helps you retract at the same time of supporting the weight of that um, evacuation or HVE like standard evacuation. Great. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, great questions, great chat. Uh, make sure you read through that uh, afterwards, some great interaction. Uh, certainly a lively uh, group and very interested in the subject. And thank you so much for bringing it to the forefront to us tonight. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I've, I've really enjoyed working with you, Dr. Severance and Henry Schein. So happy to do this for you guys. Great. And as always, what we do at Henry Schein, if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, you can send them at webinars at henryshine.com. And if you go to our YouTube page at Henry Schein, please subscribe so you get the latest information. With that, I wish you all a, a great evening. Whitney, again, thank you for joining us. Thank all of you for the uh, attendance tonight. Thanks, you guys.